Okay. So, uh, so welcome to, to our track, uh, and uh, thanks for finding the room, because it's definitely, it definitely wasn't one used in, in, in the morning session. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Sammy Hopkin, who uh, got his master's in 74, I believe. 69. 69? That says 74. I was, no, well, that's wrong. I was the second master's ah, degree that was awarded okay. by this institution. Well, there you go. So, 69. And, uh, and he'll be talking to us about, uh, there's a misprint in, the, in some of the programs, so the title might be uh, different than what you have in front of you, but he'll be talking about how he helped invent the, the internet, one of the, his early experiences with distributed computing. Thank you. Thanks very much, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I cannot see you because I have stolen Dr. Brooks's glasses from the bus. <laughs> um, is he here? Not yet. Okay. There are a few distinguished guests who may or may not be here. Since I cannot see you, oh, please be comfortable. Take your shoes off or whatever you need to do. Um, so uh, there are a few distinguished uh, guests. Um, Senator Price, representing Price. Uh, Dr. Peacock, chairman of the faculty. Um, Florence Peacock, self-styled diva of Chapel Hill, who is the soloist with the really terrible orchestra of the Triangle. This is our website, by the way. If I get too boring, you can look this up, and you may be slightly amused on rtoot.org. Erwin um, Danziger, I hope he gets to come. And of course, the founders of the program, Dr. Brooks and Lidmore Jones, who Lidmore Jones was a major, major, major um, secondary figure to Dr. Brooks. And so I would be delighted if she showed up. And um, daughter, son, grandchildren, and other members of the Master's Committee. All righty. Since I'm wearing Dr. Brooks's glasses and he is wearing mine, I will have to do this. The title of the paper is um, How I Invented the Internet, colon, Every title these days has to have a colon, does it not? How I Invented the Internet, colon, the first distributed processing application. And by the way, if you haven't guessed already, this uh, is kind of put on at 3 o'clock in the afternoon for comedy relief after all of these things have been doing today. So, you know, if you feel like that, please do so. If you don't, then I'll feel like I fell flat. Um, so that's the title of the paper. Um, and I would like to say that um, this is a work in progress. I think on the, uh, perhaps on the internet or on the website for this conference, the complete abstract is printed uh, along with the correct title. And um, I believe that it does point out that this is a work in progress. Or the dog ate my homework. <laughs> so um, so th that, that is the synopsis. So I'd really like to kind of start at the end. Um, and I think we've kind of done the synopsis, namely I haven't written the speech yet. And then we go to item, the penultimate item, which is my current status in the professional field. I'm not a computer scientist. I don't understand anything about computer science today. I feel like that I have not moved on, but the computer science field has moved on. I think the computer science field moved on about two days ago, and so those of you who have expecting to get degrees next week, well, you better hurry up and get a job real quick. Otherwise, you're going to be behind the eight ball. I'm serious. Okay. Um, so today, I'm a musician, um, which is kind of mathematical in, in, uh, in, in, in the way of the scheme of things, as people tell me that musicians are often good mathematicians. And I did not get an undergraduate degree in computer science, because at the time, there was no undergraduate degree in computer science, and there was no computer science department. It was, a, it was the department of information science, because what we learned were pure information processing theories. Marvin Minsky and um, Peter Callender, and you know people who really dealt with Turing machines and you know manipulations of zeros and ones at a very very fundamental level, which led to a lot of the things that you see around this room. Um, so I retired from IBM after 30 years of um, service. I don't know. I was never very stellar. Um, employed at IBM. I always made threes. Um, it's Diane Pazeski in this room. Dr. Pazeski was a colleague of mine at IBM. She became a fellow. I remain just a simple girl. <laughs> That's a women's lib statement. Um, and so today, I'm the organist and choir master at Amity United Methodist Church in Chapel Hill. 
You may know Amity. It's the one next door to the YMCA, down Martin Luther King at the corner of Martin Luther King and Estes. Oh, this is not a preaching. I'm not trying to get you to come. <laughs> but that's where we sell Christmas trees, most Decembers, and pumpkins at Thanksgiving, to give you some idea of the context. Um, I live about four miles away in a, a, a little neighborhood called Lake Forest, or Grandma's Lake exists. And I would go into the story of Grandma's Lake, but I'll do that at the cocktail hour later this afternoon. Um, I'm also the founder and conductor of the really terrible orchestra of the Triangle. And um, in that capacity, I would like to invite you to our concert, which is coming up in a couple of weeks on Monday night. I will not consider, I will not continue doing shameless self-promotion during this learned seminar. <laughs> okay. <coughs> I guess. Okay. I would like to express my extreme deep gratitude to Dr. Frederick Brooks, Dr. Peter Callinger, uh, Dr. Don Stannett and his wife Sylvia, as well as Liv Moore, of course, and Stephen Pizer, who, after a not very well done orals, allowed me to escape the department. And I'll never forget Dr. Brooks said, Well, Sandy, we've decided to give you a master's degree because we don't think you'll ever embarrass the department. <laughs> <laughs> and then came this afternoon. <laughs> um, so, um, we can go to the beginning, okay. Um, I um, did a master's thesis developing a three-dimensional graphics display device, which is known as the Hobgood device, um, and a, that's not the Hobgood device, but the Hobgood device was the same thing that was made with um, embroidery hoops from my wife's needlepoint business, uh, some silver mylar that was stretched between the embroidery hoops, an old 1940s Philco radio that I had inherited from some relative, that made the vibrations, and then the 2250 graphics display device, which I understand is now not available or something like that? Oh, it's been surplus. It's been surplus. So someday, maybe, when, when uh, we all get to be rich and famous, we will um, be able to find one and display the original very focal mirror device, which I invented, along with a lot of help from um, a guy, Bolt Berenick and Newman, whose name escapes at the moment. He had the same kind of thing hooked up to an oscilloscope, so you can see the oscilloscope, the dot would go in and out as well as the squiggly line of the sine wave. Okay, so it was kind of like that. So, um, my master thesis, by the way, is still available in both the undergraduate and the graduate libraries under something about a very focal, very focal mirror device. My uh, ex-wife's picture is in there. Also, because she was one of my subjects, peering into the screen, seeing these vivid images in three dimensions in the mirror. Um, but we won't talk any further about my ex-wife. <laughs> the, um, the, uh, the, the uh, yeah, let's get to how I invented the internet. Um, <laughs> uh, not the most significant thing I've done in my life, but it was pretty cool. I went to work at IBM in Yorktown Heights in the research center, where I think they developed that thing that was on Jeopardy a while back, Watson. And Watson, I think, is responsible for a lot of things like Siri. Mine is not Siri. Mine is a dear old gen English gentleman named Jeeves. Um, and if any of the young people know, if any of the old people don't know how to change the character of Siri, there's a seminar at the cocktail hour afterwards. And if any young people can tell me how to officially change Siri's name into Jeeves, I would be most grateful. Anyway. This is the size of the supercomputer at NASA Ames, which was the business end of the distributed processing application that I wrote in the early days of the internet, when there were, would you believe, young people, five nodes in the internet. It was, it was IBM Research, NASA Ames, Bell Labs in Naperville, Illinois, Carnegie Mellon University, and one other one. Does any undergraduate know how many nodes there are in the internet today? 50 billion? I don't know. There's 8 billion people on the face of the earth, so there must be at least 16 billion internet devices. Um, so that was the five people that were in the internet when I developed this distributed processing device and, or application. Basically, what happened was I took some data from an x ray diffractometer and a gas chromatograph in the laboratory at Yorktown and um, 
reduced that uh, data from machines that I had no earthly idea what they were doing, but I had numbers, floating point numbers, and then I sent them up to NASA Ames over a 240 baud phone line. Does anybody know what baud means anymore? <laughs> anyway, that's bits per second or bytes. Bits, bits per second, I think. 240 bits per second over a modem that was kind of like something like this, and you'd have to you know, call NASA Ames and, are you there, are you there? Yes, we're here, you're here. And then you put it down on this other device to capture the <laughs> of telephones back in the day. <coughs> Let me digress for nothing. Um, but I saw a neat show on TV. Um, so anyway, we took this data from the gas chromatograph and we sent it over this 240-bit phone line to NASA Ames, where there was a secret computer that fits in my pocket today. Can you imagine such a thing? It was the size of three buildings at NASA. They crunched the numbers. The algorithms were supplied by my colleagues at IBM Research, and the algorithms were sent along with the, um, that's quite all right, don't worry about it. In the really terrible, in the, what? In the really, in the really terrible orchestra of the triangle at the beginning of the concerts, we always say, Please turn your cell phones on in order to detract from any of the horrible noises that may emanate from the stage. <laughs> we, supply, we supply earplugs at the door, official R2 earplugs with our logo on. Um, we, we supply earplugs at the door for those who are pregnant or nursing. Um, but I digress. Um, NASA crunched the numbers, sent them back to me, and then I put them up on the verifiable display device, which you can see the follow-on in the back room. This is the this is not the Hobgood device. This is the Hobgood squared device, after it's got steroids, and uh, so that's that's where the data was was displayed at the other end of the distributed application process. And I know that this is the first distributed application process on the internet because it didn't stay up enough to actually have applications that would work all the way through to the end. So. Um, anyway, that's my claim to fame, <laughs> along with, as you know, a certain vice presidential candidate who shall remain nameless. Um, so, Carnegie Mellon, Bell Labs, Bolt Bear, and Newman. Oh, in the abstract, which is on the website for this conference, you will see a reference to something about Bolt Bear. This is what I printed off at home today after Vance, uh, one of the graduate students, tried to help me use this device to access this abstract, which was on my home computer, to be able to print it off on a printer in this building, which I was just blown away at. Did you know you could do that these days? <laughs> Lord, that <Edwards>. was. <laughs> um, so, um, so anyway, that was my master's degree device, which now I took to Yorktown, IBM Research. They made up a similar thing out of um, Carved aluminum, that's not what the machinists call it. Carved aluminum is what? It's milled. Milled aluminum, aluminium, as the British say. And that's what my that's what my Siri says. Jeeves says aluminium. <laughs> he also says, the how many of you from up north? Okay. How many people are gay? Okay. Well, there you go. Um, anyway, I digress again, as usual. Um, oh, I was gonna talk about Mevin. Anybody from Mevin? Okay. <laughs> people, people on television, mostly of whom are A-type people, which is my new euphemism for the Y word. Most people call it Mebane on television. We're going to do a remote now from Mebane, North Carolina. Jeeves <laughs> says Mebane also, <laughs> which is Mebane of this modern day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, I mean, that was my, I mean, oh, but the point is that I did a very, very, very early piece of a very, very, very tiny bit of the internet, and that has been um, evolved into my claim that I helped Al Gore invent the internet. Um, I'm about ready to take questions, and they better be funny questions. Um, I did mention Peter Callinger, Don Stanett, um, 
Frederick Free Books and Stephen Heiser. Um, oh, yeah, those of you who are um, sad to say going to be looking for jobs um, very soon if you're getting a degree, all I'd like to say is that I never wanted to go to work for IBM at all. I mean, I thought the idea of going to work in a white shirt and a tie and wearing a pinstripe suit and wingtips. I guess people don't wear wingtips anymore, do they? Anyway, they're old-fashioned old shoes. Um, was not any kind of a career that I wanted. I really kind of, you know, and became eventually a musician. However, um, one day I was in my, um, at my office at my desk as a graduate student instructor over in New West, which I think you've seen pictures of around here and there, um, in the lobby, right? And um, so anyway, there's these pictures of New West over there. When I walked in, I almost shed a tear because of the humble beginnings of this great department. And um, so I really would like to um, call your attention to those pictures of, um, that was the department. The there were five of us. It was Dr. Brooks, Lib Moore, myself, and the girl that got the first master's degree and somebody else. And if you're in this room as a distinguished person, raise your hand. I don't remember the other person. Anyway, the point is, I got a call at my desk one day from IBM Yorktown Heights Research, and I said, I almost said, well, I don't really want to go to work for IBM because I'm a blue jeans kind of person, and this was in the days of the hippies. I was not really a hippie. I was kind of an ultra-conservative but in college, but you know, it was valuable to me to get a job where I could wear jeans. So I applied at places like um, Xerox, Palo Alto, and um, um, uh, Bolt Airman and Newman and Bell Labs and places like that. So at least I got in kind of along with those guys at IBM Research. Um, so anyway, I said to the recruiter, I said, well, I'll think about coming up to um, Yorktown and talk to you guys, um, but tell me how to get there because the only other place that I've been, I'm from Durham, as you haven't been able to tell. Um, <laughs> the only other place I've been, I was a National Merit Scholar, and so I was invited to go up to uh, University of Michigan, I think that's the one in Ann Arbor, and um, for an interview. And so I flew up and got over to the dormitory where I was supposed to stay. It was late at night, so I didn't see anything. The next day, they said, just take the bus over to this particular building. I had the map and everything, and I'm a Cherokee Indian, and so I have an incredible sense of direction. And um, so I got on the bus, was, was being driven over to the interview facility, and the snow the piles of snow was up as far as the bus windows. And I thought, no, 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 this is not going to be happy to me. But I digress. Um, when they asked me to come to research, Hertz told me to go up to Yorktown Heights along Route 9A. I mean, the turnpike was there. The three-way was there. Um, Sawmill Parkway was there. All kinds of better places, ways to get to IBM Research than Route 9A, which goes right past Sing Sing, the um, in, an infamous prison in some movie, which is actually located at Ossining, New York. So I, in this snow, snow blizzard, me who had never been north of East Lansing, Ann Arbor, um, tried to get up to this interview where I was going to meet the IBM people that I didn't want to go to work for. Uh, so I stopped at a diner, which I thought was really, really cool, because we never had anything like that in the South before, one of those silver things, you know, that you go to late at night. And I had a cup of coffee and asked them, well, how do you get to um, Yorktown Heights? And I was staying in uh, whatever the town is next to it. And um, so, so uh, she said, well, what in the world are you doing? Well, she didn't say what in the world, but, you know, these diner, diners, waitresses late at night said, Something like, what in the world are you doing on Route 9A? And to make a long story short, I finally got up to the hotel and managed to get myself over to Yorktown at the laboratory the next morning. I walked in and I thought, holy crap, there are guys running around in ponytails and beards and blue jeans and sandals. And remember, it was in the middle of the winter. So <laughs> I urge you to take advantage of all your possible opportunities, even if you think it might not work out for you because you just never know. The Lord works in mysterious ways. Are there any questions? Thank you. We do indeed have time for a few questions. Sandy? I'm, I'm Jim Scott. I was here when you were here. Oh, were you the fifth I, one? I vaguely remember... Um, Continue. Remember, Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> I remember a little about your research, and it seems to me that there was, there was another version of it done with the 
the membrane from a, a banjo. Really? <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool. But that wasn't you. Was oh, it? I remember you, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, the banjo came after me, and I don't really know anything about it. However, I do know something about feature-based geometric stitching algorithms. How many people know about feature-based geometric stitching algorithms? Please raise your hands. Hi. John! Hi! Sweetie! <laughs> Sweetie! Because I was at the 1968 Hemisphere in San Antonio at the IBM booth. And I got picked out of the audience, and they stitched my initials in this little oh, fabric that I still have. Cool. John is also a musician. Pazeski? Yep. <laughs> I was just asking after your wife. She was the fellow, he was not. Well, that's funny. Correct. He was the fellow, she was not. No. I'm glad that's not funny anymore. <laughs> <laughs> because it says we've come a long way in the history of sexual relationships. He, you're the no, only I don't one. have those either. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the um, feature-based geometric stitching algorithm is an example of Fred Brooks's genius. Because by reading those few words, knowing what I know about geometry, knowing what I know about needlework, knowing what I know as an undergraduate in mathematics about algorithms, and knowing that feature-based is just one of those common things that you introduce a title with, I know exactly what feature-based geometric sti stitching algorithm is all about. Because Dr. Brooks has this uncanny ability to read his extremely, extremely concept, com complicated concepts into a few words that people like even me can understand. Would you not agree, John? Yes. Brilliant, brilliant. John is a much more wealthy musician than I am. <laughs> he owns his own company, so. Tell, could you take no three minutes? <laughs> no, three minutes. I've got, I've got seven minutes. I've, my I've got seven minutes and I yield them to the senator from, no. you're not going to do it? Okay, <laughs> then I will make an attempt. What he does is he takes people playing the piano, like Vladimir Ashkenazi, or was he a violinist? Last business. What? Oh, that was my last business. Oh, yeah. okay, I don't know what you do now, but the last business was really cool. Um, he could replicate using the computer, of course, and any instrument, especially the piano, but maybe any old instrument, yep. not MIDI, but the real instrument, and it would be the way that you would have heard Vladimir Horowitz play the piano on a piano that had very little equipment attached to it, as I recall. No, tons of robotics. Well, that, but that, that was all backstage. Yes. Yeah, it was all backstage. So all you saw was this piano. And I believe the keys actually work. Yes. Yep. The keys actually work, and you can hear. Um, what, what's what's the most classical musician you actually? But you digress. <laughs> Are there any further questions? <laughs> uh, why don't you explain some more about how small West House was? Oh. I mean, was it 800 square feet? 700? I mean, it was. I had an office there. Anybody else have an office there? I was there. Yeah. That was my office. Would you say 600 square feet? <laughs> no, there were, bigger than that. When I was there, it was eight desks. Right. No. So 80 feet per desk. Uh, six 1600. in the front room and two in the back. Not 2,000. No. No. Not no. anywhere near 2,000 square no. feet. It's a two room. Counting Fred's office and yeah. lips. You well, were there. Yeah, the, there. Hall, the room's along the hall. There was a little hall connecting the front. That's right. Room. Excuse <laughs> us. They had CAI companies. Really, and they weren't big enough for an office anyway. But that's how I got my IBM job. I answered the telephone on this little desk in West End. <laughs> they thought somebody questions? else. <laughs> Further questions? Well, I have one, actually, from oh, no. a younger generation. But basically, uh, you know, you talked about transferring all your data across the country on a, on a very thin modem, right? mm -hmm. and then getting, getting the answer back. Um, did you do anything, did you have to take into consideration anything about the fact that you have this long latency to your computational uh, you know, resource? Mm -hmm. Or because there was no real kind of principles of distributed computing yet, uh, were, were, you know, was that something that you know, was just kind of largely ignored? I mean, to what extent was the distributed part really mm -hmm. well understood when they put it together? 
I think this is the point at which the lecturer says, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, we applied some of the extreme fundamentals of what we learned in some class that wasn't called security because we didn't have any security back then, but it was something about redundancy and um, um, hash checking and yeah, stuff sure. like that. Yeah. So, but you had to do it all in the application layer. Um, IBM had not yet invented systems network architecture, so. Um, so are you? <laughs> I guess it, it sounds like a bunch of inside jokes, but it's not really. Dr. Pazeski, neither Dr. Pazeski nor Dr. Pazeski worked very closely with me. This Dr. Pazeski was my manager once upon a time, and I don't remember whether Diane actually ever had to deal with me or not. No. No. So, <laughs> That's why she was willing to go into management later for yeah. a very short time. Right, right, right. Until she learned better. Until she learned better, yeah. yeah. Anyway, at IBM at the time, there was a um, two track process. You could go along the management track, or you could go along the scientific track. And the myth that they told me when I interviewed at IBM was that you could rise to the same level on either of the tracks. <laughs> <laughs> has, has a fellow ever become CEO of IBM? No. I don't think so. Okay, so it's a falsity that the scientific track is as good as the management. In certain um, aspects, obviously in management you make more money, but who gives a crap about money, right? We are scientists and we want to do science. So, you know, what you do is you think, well, I'll follow the scientific and then one day I'll be paid as much as the CEO. Well, that's not the way it works. <laughs> okay. Um, are there any other questions? Yes, sir. I remember uh, nobody from the scientific area ever became, at an early age, the administrative assistant to the CEO at IBM, which was the track of the CEO. Ah, okay. Acres administrative assistant was Tom Mazzano. I mean, I can say <laughs> Ginny Rometty was the <laughs> Okay. Um, did everybody hear that? I'll try to repeat basically um, the. Um, uh, Dr. Dr. Akers, who was the CEO, had an administrative assistant. Sam Tom was on. Sam Tom, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Well, let's thank our speaker for a very entertaining <laughs> at, at an orchestra concert, if you clap a lot, we get to come back and do an encore. <laughs> <laughs> we have a few minutes to switch rooms if, uh, if, if you're interested in one of the other talks. And of course, we'll allow some of the other people from the other talks to enter this room. But while our next speaker is setting up,